Blakely, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have only the kindest feelings for our good friend we're debating tonight, and for his obvious sincerity and earnestness, uh, I'm grateful. But when I tell you that he has simply abandoned his proposition in this final speech, I tell you that which every thoughtful person in this audience recognizes. He's made no effort to defend it in the second uh, speech of the evening. Uh, he is bewildered and confused about it, and I'd be more so if I were on his side. He's doing as well as anybody could do, trying to prove a proposition that is untenable. Remember this, it's not does the Spirit dwell in us. We all believe that. The question is, the matter at issue is simply this. Does he dwell in us bodily, personally, literally, and uh, abstractly in his own person? Now, I have here a sheet of paper, and it's a blank one. I'm going to ask uh, my moderator to pass it over to his table for him to put in large figures the passage of Scripture that says that the Spirit dwells in us literally, bodily, personally, and in his own person. Now, he'll either do that, in which case he will have uh, sustained his proposition, or if he doesn't do that, he will have failed, as every person knows here tonight. Now, bear in mind that it won't do the job to get up here and put a passage in it that says that the Spirit is in us. We all believe that. Any passage he quotes, I believe that. He may quote another, I believe it too. He may put them all together that say that the Spirit's in us. We all believe that. That's not the issue. The issue is, does he dwell in us personally, bodily, literally? Now, you remember that, and it won't do the job now, uh, Brother Brackley, to write some passage on that that doesn't have in it the words bodily, actually, and personally. He spent nearly half of his speech in matters that were wholly irrelevant. He talked in some detail about the covenants, which has nothing to do about this, about the first man, Adam, and the second term, Adam Christ, which has no uh, significance at all in this. He did make this statement that is pertinent. He says that how do we know that we dwell in God and God in us by his spirit, indeed so. Wonderful statement. But now, how does the Spirit enable us to know that we dwell in Him and He in us? In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? We were buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in newness of life. How do we know that we're in Him? Because we've done what we are told to do in order to be in him. But who told us to do that? And who told us that that's where we are when we do it? Well, it was Paul writing by the direction of the Holy Spirit. Look at it now, 1 Corinthians 2 and 13. Which things also we speak, not in words of man's wisdom, but in the words of the Holy Spirit comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So, friends, the Spirit tells us whether we're in Him or not, and that by the testimony that He gave. Romans 8 and 16, the Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. So certainly He tells us, but He does it in that fashion. Now, I missed the point completely about the harlot. He said that the harlot uh, to the person who engages in that is joined to one flesh. Of course it is. That's what the passage says. But the argument was this. You say that the fact that we're joined to one spirit puts us, uh, puts the spirit in us. Well, since one is joined to a harlot, then that would put the harlot in one. If not, why not? Why didn't he deal with the question? Does it complete it? Perhaps he didn't understand what it was. He has another change. Now, I'm glad that he mentioned John 7 and 39. Ordinarily, this is frequently cited in support of a vain attempt to prove a literal indwelling. It says nothing of the kind, there's nothing about it. But now I know what's said. Uh, the passage makes mention of the fact, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow uh, rivers of living water. And this spake he of the Spirit, which the world, of course, cannot receive, and which had not been given, for Christ had not been glorified. Now you watch, please. That promises the Spirit to somebody, but then not to the baptized believer. This doesn't say that it is promised to the baptized believer. I raise the question, who is it that is to receive that promise? Not the 
uh, world because the world can't receive it. Not Christians, because the only way he thinks they receive it is by being baptized and received, allegedly, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what is the statement here? Quite obviously a reference to the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, and out of them flowed the rivers of living water, the wonderful, marvelous blessings of salvation. Now that covers his speech, item by item, statement by statement, and if there'd been an argument involved, it would have included it too. I want to introduce some matters here that it seems that he doesn't want to introduce, at least hasn't thus far, and I wanted to get it in record because of the fact that it's pertinent to this discussion whether he wants to debate it or not. And that is, what is the gift of the Holy Spirit? In response to the query, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter answered, Acts 2 and verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ye is the subject of that sentence. It is a personal pronoun the, the, and the nominative, and therefore the subject of the sentence. Shall receive is the predicate, that is the verb of the passage. Shall receive is a transitive verb. In the nature of the case, a transitive verb must have a direct object. A direct object must be, in the case of the object, the accusative case. So we must look for the direct object of the verb shall receive. What is it? Not the spirit, because spirit in the passage is in the genitive case, the same as uh, the possessive case in English. So spirit there is not the object of the transitive verb shall receive. Gift is, you shall receive gift. The gift there is in the accusative case. So that which is promised is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not the Holy Spirit, but that which the Holy Spirit gives. Now you watch very carefully, friends, that the gift of God is not God, but something God gives. The gift of Christ was not Christ, but something Christ gave. The gift of the Holy Spirit was not and is not the Holy Spirit, but that which the Holy Spirit gave. It is a subjective uh, genitive here and conveys the notion of that which the Spirit gave. Now, I want us to put up chart 16, the title of which is, The Bible is Its Own Best Interpreter. I'm doing this as a study tonight. It's apparent that the debate has uh, uh, shifted to a different ground and that uh, we're not really debating the issue. And so I want to get before us here some material. And how much time now do I have here? Uh, at any rate, let's put the chart up here. The Bible, its own best interpreter. Let me call your attention to this now. And I make the unqualified affirmation that in every instance, where the word receive occurs in connection with the Holy Spirit, it has reference to a miraculous reception. Now, I can either prove that or I can't, and you'll decide tonight whether I can prove that from the Scripture. Here are the passages, John 7 and 39. Here, it makes mention of the fact that out of them shall flow rivers of living water, quite obviously an illusion to the blessings that flowed out of the apostles on the day of Pentecost. Quite obviously, a miraculous one. John chapter 20, verses 20 and 21 here. When Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Here again, a reference to the coming of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. In Acts 1 and 8, when the question was raised, Will thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? The Lord said that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So the power there came by the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, they were to receive the promise of the Father. But the promise of the Father was that which they saw on that day. Now, I call your attention to, first, to Acts 1 and 4, the promise of the Father. In this passage here, Acts 2.33, it refers to the promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Spirit was the same as the promise of the Father. But since the promise of the Father was not the Father, but what the Father promised, then it follows that the promise of the Spirit was not the Spirit, but what the Spirit promised. 
And that is the revelation that was made. Now look again in Acts 8 and 15. When the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of the Lord, they sent unto them Peter and John. When they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. There again, miraculous. Acts 8 and 17. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Another miraculous one. In Acts 8 and 19, still, uh, uh, Simon tried to buy the power of enabling people to receive the miraculous form of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 10, 47, who can forbid water that these uh, should not be baptized, seeing they received the Holy Ghost as well as we. How did Peter know that they'd received it? Acts 10, 45, on them was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit, for we heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. A miraculous reception. In Acts 19 and 6, we have the case of the Samaritans in which um, there is uh, where Paul found these people over there and how they had John's baptism. And he asked them about it. We haven't time to discuss it. would be glad to do so a little later. But anyway, he laid his hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Miraculous. And in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 2, receive the Holy Spirit here. Get the statement now. Paul said, this only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith. This was characteristic of a miraculous manifestation because at that time they had to be thus guided. They're not being any uh, book or available or New Testament written available for them. Now then, the other instance is in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Does it stand a reason, ladies and gentlemen, that in every other instance where the word receive is used with the Holy Spirit, that it would refer to a miraculous event, and then in Acts 2 to refer to a so-called ordinary one. And then another thing. Bear in mind that those people back there were receiving miraculous powers. So far as we can tell, in every instance, when there was apostle present, hands were laid on. Don't you think it a little silly to say that what this means is is an ordinary gift which you can't understand and not even know you have at the same time that you have a miraculous, bountiful bestowal of it. That's like setting somebody down to a table that's loaded with marvelous delicacies, and then after it's over, say, here's a dish that I want you to have that you can't see and you can't taste and has no calories in it. Now, this is exactly the type of argument that these people make on this. But now let's take another look here. Turn over uh, to uh, chart 17. We'll have uh, chart 17 that we want to uh, deal with here. As soon as we get it uh, on the uh, screen, we'll begin with it. I want to call your attention to the fact that every time that the word gift is used with the Holy Spirit, it always has reference to a miraculous gift. Acts 8 and 20, the gift of God, obviously that. I haven't the time to discuss each of these passages. I will if he raises the question. In Acts 10, 45, they received the gift of the Spirit because they could speak with tongues. The light gift, Acts 11, 17, refers to the gift uh, that Cornelius received that was comparable to that on the day of Pentecost. Ephesians 3, 7, gift of the grace of God. That's Paul's allusion to his apostleship which was obviously miraculous. Ephesians 4 and 7, measure of the gift of Christ, where he set some in the church, apostles, prophets, and so on. Obviously, a miraculous gift. Acts 2, 38, the uh, same uh, gift uh, mentioned. And then in Luke 11 and 13, he knows how to give the Holy Spirit uh, to those who ask him. This could not be what he alleges is supposed to be the gift of the Spirit in Acts 2, following baptism to everybody, because this says, ask for it, and you get it. And that's be baptized and get it. And besides that, you can't ask for something that's promised to you on some other condition. And besides that, why ask for it if the Lord gives it in every instance? And secondly, bear in mind this, friends, you don't have to ask for it if you're baptized. So why would he say ask for it if it were the so-called uh, ordinary gift of which he's talking? Now, hopefully my time won't run out till I can get it. No one on here. How much time? Four minutes. Yes, I think I can. All right, ch uh, uh, chart 15 is our next one here. Chart 15, by which I'm going to draw a remarkable parallel here that I want you to consider uh, very uh, carefully. And uh, I believe we have it now. I have three passages of Scripture here, Acts 2.38, Acts 3.19, Mark 16, 16 through 20. Acts 2.38, 
Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 3, 9, 10, Repent and turn that your sins may be blotted out when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Mark 16, 16, 17. He that believeth in this baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned, and these signs shall follow them that believe. And a number of signs, including speaking and uh, uh, handling uh, deadly serpents, raking poison, laying hands on the sick that they might recover. Now you watch the parallel. And note that I have par uh, parentheses around some words here. The reason is that they're implied but not in the text. The others are in the text. Acts 2, believe, repent, be baptized, remission of sins, gift of the Holy Spirit. Look at exact parallel. Acts 3, 19, repent, turn, sins blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come. Look at Mark 16, 16, repent, be baptized, uh, believe and be baptized and save, signs follow. Now look. In the first column, believe, believe, believe. Second column, repent, repent, repent. Third column, be baptized, turn, which is the baptism act, and be baptized. Uh, fourth column, remission of sins, sins blotted out, saved. Uh, last column, gift of the Holy Spirit, seasons of refreshing, and signs following. It doesn't take a Solomon to see an exact parallel there. It follows then that that gift was a gift of the Spirit in that day that involved the laying on of apostles' hands. I have more to say on that later if he raises questions regarding it. Now, he had some nice things to say about us, and we appreciate that, and particularly about the brethren here. I'd think that Tom about would be fair play. Uh, I would suggest then that he issue us a challenge uh, to come to his tabernacle in his city and debate the instrumental music question. How about it, Mr. Blakely? <laughs>